Uh, this morning we're going to have, as you may have already put together, a somewhat unorthodox chapel, and by unorthodox, you understand what I mean. Uh, we're we're uh, talking about the mission and vision statement, but with particular focus on the mission that uh, God, we believe God has given Wheaton Graduate School. And you'll be hearing from me in a few minutes. Uh, you'll also be hearing from Sally Canning, who just arrived from Kansas. And if you've been following the news lately, you've, you've, you've probably heard about the train that derailed in Kansas uh, with 49 passengers injured. Uh, Dr. Sally Canning was on that train. And uh, thankfully, thankfully, she is OK and she's with us. Uh, but sh she'll be sharing a little bit about that. And actually, it, as it turns out, this relates to our graduate school vision. And then you'll be hearing from uh, Christy McGarvey about developments uh, on, on the student government end. And then finally, uh, Dr. Canning and I are, uh, are going to handle Q&A. Just to be clear, Dr. Canning's role here is she is uh, chair of the Graduate Council, very important position. Uh, her office and my office work very closely in uh, trying to advance the interests of the graduate school. What I want to try to do is, I'm not going to talk so much about the future. But I will say this, there's, there's so many things right now that are in flux uh, in the graduate school. And we're in a place where, in a sense, we're putting everything on the table all over again. And so this is an exciting time. It's unlikely, unless this is your first year of a PsyD program or PhD program, that any of these changes will impact you uh, directly. Um, but you're part of this conversation. And so I'm excited to talk about um, our core values, our mission. And I was wondering, if I, can I get the mission slide up? OK. Can, can you guys read that? All right, back there. OK. So uh, that is our mission statement. And in leading up to the mission statement, and I need to watch my clock closely, uh, what I want to do is uh, bring this back to the word. And I'm reminded in our lead up to Easter of John chapter 13, where John writes that it was just before Passover, and I'm in John 13:1. And Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and to go to the Father. And having loved his own who were in the world, he was now showed them uh, the full extent of his love. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. And Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Here we see John telling the story about Jesus, and this story, in its own way, speaks to our mission statement to form servant scholars and leaders through exceptional graduate programs for Christ and his kingdom. This is also John's way of wrapping up Jesus' ministry. Jesus and the disciples have served hard. Jesus has, has taught much. And now the end is near, and this is Jesus' summative statement. You might even say that when washing the disciples' feet, Jesus is giving his own mission statement, not in words, but in actions. He wants to describe in a nutshell, what his ministry, what his life has been all about. And he does so by taking up a towel, kneeling down, and washing the disciples' feet. Jesus is trying to give full disclosure, full communication. Full disclosure and full communication are, are important. I remember one time when a, a former P, PH, or a graduate from our PhD program, Chris Atwood, had volunteered a, a house in Whitby Island, Washington. Anyone from uh, Washington in our midst today? Jim Wolfoy's not around? OK. Um, great Pacific Northwest people. They're, you know, it's, that's where my son wants to move for some reason. Anyway, um, <clears throat> so we, uh, I, I took him up on that offer. And Rick Richardson and I needed to meet on something. So we decided to do a weekend retreat in Whidbey Island. And in order to get to Whidbey Island, uh, you have to take the Milquito Ferry. 
And as we're getting in the car and driving through Mokito, we noticed that there's this odd triangle on the right-hand lane, and we were driving in the middle lane, and then a bunch of cars were in the right-hand lane. And at some point, we could see the ferry, and we really wanted to catch the ferry. We were on time for catching the ferry because we knew the ferry only left once every hour. And we thought we had it all set, and so we just finally you know, pulled in the right-hand lane, almost like you would uh, coming off the Ike onto the Stevenson or something like that. And uh, we, you know, moving along bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic for about 20 minutes until you come up to this toll house uh, that collects your money and lets you go on the ferry. And then, so we pull up to this toll house, and the, the woman in the toll house says, I'm sorry, you're going to have to get to the end of the line. And we said, well, well why? Well, because you cut in line. And we said, we, we did? He says, well, yeah. I mean, you didn't follow the triangles on the right-hand lane. And we said, oh, yeah, that's what that meant. Oh, okay, well, we're new in town. We didn't know. And she said, it doesn't matter. And, and so I said, but, you know, so uh, we kind of argued a little bit and saw it was hopeless. And afterwards, I pulled, we pulled over uh, use of facilities. And on the way out, I saw a 13-year-old kid with, in soccer gear. I started up a conversation with him. And he was so excited to tell me about his mother who, who hotlined this Subaru Forester who cut in line. And, uh, and she was so proud of her. And I said, really? Tell me more about that. And, and, <laughs> and I wanted to tell it wasn't a Forester, it was an Outback. So anyway. Uh, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. It's frustrating when you come to a place and you don't know how the rules work and you don't know what it's really about. What I want to do with a mission statement, my hope for our mission statement, is that we give you full disclosure and clear communication as to what we're about. I think uh, th this mission statement describes three things about what we're about, what we're, wh what we're trying to do, how we're trying to do it, and why we're trying to do it. So in the remainder of the time, I just want to say a few uh, remarks focusing mostly on what? What are we trying to achieve at Wheaton Graduate School? What are we trying to achieve in your lives, and what are we hoping that the ideal graduate will look like? Well, two things, really. First is we're looking for servant scholars. And I believe that I speak for the faculty, staff, and the administration when I say that deploying servant scholars is an important key in advancing Christ's kingdom. Now, how uh, we accomplish this, as far as our own culture is concerned, appears to be completely backwards. But in order to explain why this is backwards in our culture's eyes, I want to talk about how education is done at a baccalaureate and post-baccalaureate level uh, for historical and societal reasons, and how I think that the way we do it at Wheaton Graduate School and how God has called us to do it is so completely different. I believe that so much of education in our culture is fragmented, and it's fragmented in as much as it resists the possibility of the unity of knowledge. Now, this together with our continuously unfolding narrative of a research-driven university with, which leads to increasingly narrow fields of inquiry and specialization um, means that the relationship between the disciplines, the relationship between segments of truth are increasingly seen as illusory. But on the Christian understanding, because we serve one God who's also the creator God who, who with a word brought creation into being, we know that behind all knowledge there is an essential unity. So in a world, in a, an academy that's fragmented, we work together in our various disciplines and fields. We collaborate, we, we celebrate our interdisciplinary nature and believe that that's part of who we are at Wheaton Graduate School. Whereas in our society, knowledge is often seen in a disembodied way, uh, where cognitive processes, uh, perception, reasoning, remain disconnected from who we are as embodied people, uh, we believe, as followers of the incarnate Lord, that cognition, reasoning, education, knowledge is always an embodied process, so that the question of what is true cannot be finally separated from who am I? And that's why you're here in chapel this morning. And that's why we care about things like our students being in the word and in prayer and shaping each other in formation, because we believe that your pursuit of truth and your pursuit of knowledge cannot be responsibly had apart 
from following God and enjoying God's presence, uh, which will shape you as scholars. For many of my professional peers, uh, the discipline of uh, the academic discipline is fundamentally agonistic. By that I mean confrontational or adversative. The Guild, especially in recent decades, has become a battleground for ideological advocacy. The goal of many, many educators is not so much to, sh to shape, but to advance a particular social political agenda or to achieve a certain conformity between students and the accept and canons of acceptable ideologies, even if uh, those ideologies come to expression in various fields uh, which engage our own fields, like education, uh, intercultural studies, and psychology. But a Christian approach to graduate education doesn't attempt to indoctrinate or, because we don't need to indoctrinate. Scripture tells us that it is God who draws us in all truth, that it is the Holy Spirit who convicts us and persuades us of the truth. And so we can rest humbly uh, knowing that uh, it is not our role to be intellectual bullies, but to simply help people shape them, uh, be shaped by God's leading and, and being the fingers and the hands on the master uh, potter as he shapes the, the students. So we are after here, as, as those who follow the risen Lord, a culture of education that is collaborative, not agonistic, that's unified, not confrontational, and moreover, uh, that takes seriously that Jesus Christ is Lord of all creation. How do we do this and why? And I'm going to answer this very quickly. How is through formation. How do we form? Well, just as when Jesus walked with his disciples in the pages of John, he walked with them, he taught them, and as he did so, they were being formed in their relationship with Jesus Christ, and they were being formed in relationship with each other. I hope that as you see yourselves as participating in the vision and mission of Wheaton Graduate School, that you take that horizontal and vertical formation seriously. Finally, the why. Why are we here? Friends, we're not here uh, to make our CVs lengthier. We're not here for uh, notable publications. We understand the value of contributing to the larger guild discussion. That's not unimportant. However, our, our job is not to play out our narcissistic kingdoms, but to live and serve the one true kingdom. I believe here at Wheaton Graduate School, we offer a place, uh, one of those rare places, where that message of serving for Christ and his kingdom uh, is consistent and clear. And I'm excited that uh, I can be part of this and that you can be part of this, and I have a great hopes for the future. I'm going to turn this now over to uh, Dr. Sally Canning. She's got a few words, and then you'll hear from Christy McGarvey. It is extra good to be with you today. Can you speak with the man in the corner? The Red Cross volunteer asked me. He's not doing very well. She knew I was a clinical psychologist and I had said that I would be happy to help in any way I could as scores of uh, traumatized passengers waited in a rec center, um, with blankets around us uh, in a remote field in southwestern Kansas. I approached the man. It was difficult to know how old he was. He might have been older than me, or it might have just been that life had been very hard on him. It looked that way. I introduced myself. Can I sit down? Sure, he said. His eyes were filmy and yellow. He was slumped over, arm in a sling. He looked like he was bracing from pain physically and emotionally. How are you? He started to tell me his story. His name was Kent, is Kent, and he was on the train because his sister had called only a couple of days earlier and said, you have to come now. Our dad in Chicago is dying. He's not going to make it. Come as soon as you can. His hands were shaking as he wrung them. His eyes looked very remote. He didn't know if he was going to make it in time to say goodbye to his father. 
He had been sending messages that his sister was reading to the father, but he wanted to be there physically and say goodbye. He did not know if he was going to make it. He was in a lot of physical pain, and he said, this has been a tough month. Tell me about it, I said. His wife had died a couple of years earlier. I stayed in my house on our reservation for three months without coming out, he said. Why did you eventually come out? Well, my brother-in-law asked if he could bring a medicine man, and they did a healing ceremony for me, and they prayed, and it's supposed to take 30 minutes, but it took several hours, and then I felt better. What else, I said. He described a long litany of stressors that would have brought anybody down in the last month, ending with, and then my little chihuahua that I raised as a puppy was stolen. He went everywhere with me. Why would someone do that? All my professionalism, all my 20 years of being a clinical psychologist, I wanted to just lay it down and sob with this man, this sweet, broken, ordinary man. I thought, oh God, did his dog really need to be stolen? Does he really need to be stranded here? But I knew the literature. I'm a clinical psychologist. I knew what he needed. I did those things. I was grateful to do it. And then I asked him, would you like me to pray with you? I said, I don't know those rituals that your son-in-law's medicine man did. And maybe it wouldn't be suitable for you. He said, no, no. I'm a Christian. I would love it if you prayed. So I did. And when we opened our eyes, his hands weren't shaking anymore. And his eyes were less filmy. And we sat like two people and talked. And we had the doctor come back and the Red Cross took over. And I checked on him multiple times throughout our long ordeal. Our prayers were answered, but not so that he could reach his father in time. His father died before he could get there. But we got him to Chicago, even though his train ticket wasn't supposed to go that far. And there were many other opportunities for me to use my clinical psychology training with people who were having panic attacks, with a man separated from his adult, uh, probably autistic son who had seizure medication and antipsychotic medication that he needed to have and it was on the train. And the sheriffs helped me to make sure that that medication was back to him in time, along with the Red Cross. There were so many opportunities for me to use my clinical psychology training there. And why, why am I telling you this in a chapel about the Wheaton College Graduate School <clears throat> to all of you here at this place? I had an ex exceptional graduate training at the University of Pennsylvania. I had Christian mentors who were known nationally and they are with me every day in the classroom. And I know the exceptional nature of the programs that you're in. I've gotten to know even more closely over this last year what happens in intercultural studies, in BIF, in education, in leadership. All of your mentors and professors and your leaders, I've watched what they do. I know their hearts. I've seen them lead. I've gotten to know some of you. This is an exceptional place. And I want to tell you that you were there in a remote field in Kansas amidst the stink of breaks and smoke. You were there in the fear. You were there in the panic because the kinds of programs that you're training in, the kinds of people that you are, the kinds of faculty that you're taught by are needed in this world. There were many moments of leadership vacuum when all it would have taken would have been some extra words, some clear communication from Amtrak. <laughs> God bless them. Um, I, I'm not dissing Amtrak, but I knew I knew with the literature, my scholarship that I had been given taught me what people needed. 
I've worked with people like Terry Watson and Nick Perrin and all my colleagues on the faculty council and the graduate council in the psychology department in all of your programs. I've watched people lead when it was needed. So I stepped up multiple times, but you were there with me stepping up. There's nothing for me to be commended in in those moments, but I felt the presence of the Wheaton College Graduate School and of my education in each of those moments. Does the world need servant scholars and practitioners? Does the world need leaders? Absolutely, absolutely. Whatever brought you here, whatever you are studying, you don't know when that's going to be needed and when that's going to be called upon and when you, not just your training, but when you are going to be called upon. The liberal arts are our foundation. Wheaton College is our strong and sure foundation. And the graduate school are the first and the second stories and the attic. It's those skills, it's those unique and deep sets of skills and attitudes all of those complex but specialized, there is a role for that in this world, to serve others when it's needed, to be willing to step up and lead when that is needed, so that the Holy Spirit that's in you will be there, that's all. It was the Holy Spirit with Kent. It was the Holy Spirit on that bus when I, I'm sure he was seven and a half feet tall, stood up shouting on the bus because the plans had changed one too many times and the communication had not been clear enough one too many times. It was the Holy Spirit that was there and it is the Holy Spirit in each of you that God wants all over the world so that he can continue to work out his kingdom here. What we sang is true, we are well cared for we have a faithful God. And Jesus is now working in and through you in every place that you are now and in every place that you will be. I am so grateful for the Wheaton College Graduate School. I am so grateful for our mission. If you are discouraged, if you are tired, please know that God will sustain you. Please know that God will use you. Trust him. Whatever brought you here, trust him. Thank your faculty, thank your leaders for who they are and what they do. And just rejoice that we are a part of this amazing kingdom. And thank you so much for this chance to share with you.